Alrighty, it got quiet, kind of like a church moment there. <clears throat> welcome everybody, good evening. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody to the Freedom Biomedical Research Institute, Ma Maury Strauss Distinguished Public Lecture. Many of you have been to these other lectures are very aware that this program is supported very generously by Mr. Maury Strauss, uh, who made it possible several years ago now. So we're very, very grateful for that support that enables us to bring in such fantastic people as we have tonight. Um, before I go ahead and introduce tonight's speaker, I always like to put in a plug for the next talk. So the next talk uh, won't be until January 25th, uh, and I think it's something you'll all be interested in. Dr. Ziad Al-Ali, who's the Chief of Research and Development at, and Director of Clinical Epidemiology at the St. Louis VA System and also on the faculty at Washington University, will be here to talk about long COVID, the lasting legacy of the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, Dr. Al Ali has published some very influential papers in big journals like Nature and Science Translational Medicine the last year or two on some of the long-term effects, particularly on the heart as well as other systems of, of COVID. So uh, something that we're all interested in, and I think it'll be a fascinating talk. So without any more delay, it's my pleasure to introduce this evening's speaker, Dr. Amy Bastian. Uh, Dr. Bastian is the Chief Scientific Officer at the Kennedy Krieger Institute and Professor of Neuroscience at John Hopkins, Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. Uh, she did her undergraduate work in physical therapy at the University of Oklahoma, and then had a stint out there working in that area for a short period of time, but was drawn back into the academic arena. And she went on to do her uh, doctoral work, her PhD, and then postdoctoral training as well at Washington University in St. Louis. And from there, she was invited to join the faculty at WashU in the Department of Anatomy and Neurobiology, and did. Uh, and then went on to Johns Hopkins University, initially in the Department of Neurology, and then in the Department of Neuroscience, her primary appointment, but also uh, appointed in the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation. Uh, she directs the Motion Lab at Kennedy Krieger, as I said, she serves as the chief scientific officer and the senior vice president there. Uh, she's received lots and lots of recognition for her accomplishments. I just mentioned a couple highlights. Um, she is uh, received the American Society for Neurorehabilitation Outstanding Clinician Scientist Award. She also received from NIH the National Institute of Neurological Disease and Stroke Senator Jacob Javits Award for one of her, her grants, her research programs. And recently, I think in the last year or so, was elected to the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, she served on the NIH Task Force on Childhood Movement for Motor Disorders and serves on the editorial boards of a number of very important journals. Just a word or two about her work, uh, which you hear a lot more about from her, obviously. Um, she's really done a, a lot of incredible things as far as I'm concerned at the interface of science and application of understanding how the brain codes for movements and how we learn things like that. It includes developing and applying smart screen-based technologies to engage and train children to learn about their balance and during physical therapy and also gave us the concept, I think, or certainly built on it, of the very long duration of a child's brain's motor networks and how they develop uh, from the earliest kind of basic patterns that are uh, developed in the brain and then building on those after, well beyond the first few years of life. And one of the things as somebody who thinks about aging a little bit uh, these days caught my attention was some of her work on the brain's trade-offs uh, with aging between cognitive performance and locomotor adaptation. One of those things a lot of us probably don't want to think about, but it's, it's fascinating, including loss of motor memory that can occur during aging. Um, she's used a, a very uh, sophisticated way of using principal component analysis of visual feedback to teach people who have problems with their gait. They're walking after a brain injury, for example, a neurological disease, uh, to develop ways to correct multiple gait abnormalities. And she's really built, I, I think most importantly for me, on the fundamental understanding of how the brain learns movement patterns and generalizes those in different contexts, applying those, those principles to rehabilitation. Uh, so for me, she's one of those scientists who does really fundamental, hard-nosed, as I call it, science and understanding how parts of the brain work, but then takes that into the realm of applying it for better health and for improved human performance. So without further ado, it's my great pleasure. Join me to welcome Dr. Amy Baskin. Well, thank you so much. And thank you for inviting me to uh, come talk to you about movement control. I have to say that's one of the best introductions I think I've ever been given. And you actually covered so much territory so nicely. So thank you so much. Um, so 
what I'm going to do today is I'm going to sort of show you uh, some information about how the brain controls movement, how it learns movement, and why it's important to understand these things, these behavioral mechanisms, in order to be able to uh, rehabilitate people who have problems with movement control. So let's get started. Okay, the first thing I'm gonna tell you is movement is complicated. This is an image from uh, the very first human uh, uh, anatomy atlas. It was published in 1543. And it just shows you that, you know, the body, sometimes we call it the physical plant, has 200 bones and about 80 joints in the arms and the legs. Now I'm standing up here talking to you and I'm not thinking about all of those joints, those bones, and I'm certainly not thinking about the 600 muscles that we use to control movement. So um, this physical plant, this body, um, has other issues that make it really kind of difficult to control. I'm gonna give you a couple examples. One is our sensors, what we see, what we feel, knowing our body position in space um, are slow and they're noisy. So just to, just to get started and keep everybody awake, let's see, let's do a little, first of all, what do I mean by slow? Slow in, for the nervous system, is on the order of, I mean, hundreds of milliseconds is super slow. 150, 100 milliseconds is very slow. And so what I like to tell everybody is that the sensory information, what you see, what you hear, what you're feeling, what you're smelling has already happened. And that is because it takes that long to get to the nervous system and for you to actually perceive it. So all your sensory information is out of date. So that, that's a problem, right? Slow sensory information. Okay. Say again. And this is on the first slide. <laughs> this is only the first slide. Yes. And so not only are these senses slow, but they're noisy. And so I'm going to have everybody do a little activity that you may have seen before, but I want you to hold up your hand and then I want you to touch your nose and then touch your thumb and then your finger and then your other finger. Okay, now close your eyes, touch your, touch your thumb, touch your pinky finger, touch your nose, touch your middle finger. <laughs> okay, you can stop. I, I would imagine, I mean, obviously it's harder to do that with, with no vision, but the sense that you use to know where your body position is in space is this proprioception and it's notoriously noisy. And so you probably had to make a lot of corrections to find where your finger was. And so that's an example of what I mean by noisy sensors. So despite this, um, this mechanical plant and slow noisy sensors, um, we do a really good job of making incredible movements. And so this is actually two women fencing uh, in the Olympics. And this depicts a lot of things that I'm interested in. It, it depicts being able to control your locomotion in, in pretty uh, incredible ways. And it also depicts your ability to make targeted movements with, in, in this case, I don't know if that's saber or foil, it looks like saber to me, but um, I'm not a fencer. But you can see that they are doing highly precise, well-timed coordinated actions. And so this is, this is a really, I think, a, an amazing thing given what the nervous system has to do. Now we're lucky because we have big brains and we have uh, highly evolved spinal cords. And so we're able, to make these, um, we're able to make these movements, but we don't come out, um, we don't come out making these movements when we're born. And so I wanna start just by sharing a little bit of information that I think you should know about brain development and how this is gonna, tie into motor learning and, and learning movement control. Our brains have 86 billion neurons and, and, and a ton of other cells that support the neurons and probably send signals to these neurons. And this brain is developing after you're born still. And what I wanna point out is that you can see what I'm showing you over here is a slice of this cerebral cortex. So it's just a, a, a um, 
a, a chunk of cerebral cortex, and these are all neurons. These are all different cells. And you can see that they um, have nice arborizations and some connections with each other. Now, those connections are pretty important. And so at two years old, right here, you can see it's dense and it's highly connected. Now, what does that mean? That means that you are at two years old, you have 700 synapses per second-ish that are forming. So these connections, 700 of them a second, and you have twice the number of connections or synapses than an adult. So that means they have all this potential to uh, form pathways that might be useful to them. Now, the six-year-old, you can see, it's not as dense. And the reason is that once you hit this, this peak volume of the brain, you start to prune away the things that you don't need. And so the connections that stick are the ones that you use the most. So you start with a lot of, a lot of extra connections, but then you pare down to the connections that are used the most. And what that means is that the amount of experience, um, good or bad, is what determines if those connections stick. So this is a, a happy toddler. And as many of you know, they're really active. And this toddler, to learn to walk, to learn to walk well, is going to take 2,400 steps per hour. That's 7.7 .7 football fields, if you, if you speak in terms of football. Um, and so this is an enormous amount of activity. And this, act, this particular activity is a good one because we want this child to be very mobile and to be able to get around. And so the um, dose of activity, how much you need is very high when you're starting to learn as, as, an, as, a, as a young child. Um, and we think that in, in, as you age, you still need a whole lot of activity in order to be able to learn to change your movement. Um, so what I want you to get out of this first part is that the connections that connect different parts of the brain, so this is an image of a, of a brain, and this is a diffusion tensor image where you can see how pathways are running through the brain. This is going to be formed early in life, and it, it's dependent partially on experience. So that two-year-old. But then, lucky for us, this is not a static situation. And so we can modify through all kinds of um, learning processes uh, how the brain is going to uh, process information and control movement. And so when I say um, that the brain is plastic, what I mean is that the brain learn can modify its own connections based on the experiences that you have. So. If nothing else, I want you to remember that your, your, your two-year-old and below, they need a lot of experiences um, in order to develop um, an appropriate or a, the, a more ideal uh, structure in the brain. And you can see kids lagging behind when they don't have that experience. Okay, so now I'm gonna turn and talk to you a little bit about the kind of science that I do with both children and adults. And I'm gonna um, use a lot of animations to tell you some things. And I'll, I'll explain what I mean in just a moment. But first, I want to, um, I want to talk a little bit more about the adult nervous system and, the, um, and how learning actually um, is a non-intuitive thing that you might not think at all about. So this is our, our, our guy um, from our fabric of the human body. And you can see all of his muscles. And what you'll notice is he's picking up his arm. So, audience participation. Which muscle do you think he turns on when he picks up his arm first? Deltoid, everybody's going deltoid. Okay, well, let's see, is it the deltoid? Oh, well, the answer was no. <laughs> um, okay, it might be, you know, yeah, something, something stabilizing back here, right? So it could be latissimus or subscapularis. Nope, that's not the first muscle that turns on. Well, maybe it's something in the leg, you know, because you got to stand up as you're making this movement. The answer to that is no. Any other guesses before I give you give you the answer? 
Well, the brain is first, sure. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yes, the brain is first. Um, but actually, this muscle right here in the front of your leg. So this muscle turns on about 50 milliseconds before your biceps and your deltoid. You don't think about this, nor do you think, do you actually voluntarily activate that muscle. So what happens is that the nervous system actually has to learn this coupling because it has to learn that whenever you pick up your arm, you knock yourselves backwards. And so if you have a toddler or no toddlers, and they pick up their arms with excitement, what they usually do is they fall backwards. They learn, as they're learning to locomote, to coordinate these actions based on continuing failures and errors that they're making. And a part of the brain that I'm gonna talk about is the cerebellum, which we think is very important in modifying this throughout your whole life. So you're constantly learning these new relationships. For example, if I, if I give you a 20 pound weight to hold, or maybe a two pound weight if you're me, um, you have, now this solution isn't gonna work anymore, right? Because you've got this extra mass out here. And so what happens is that the nervous system has to adapt or learn a new motor pattern. So we need, we need stronger activation here, stronger activation here, and the timing has to be just right. And the way that the nervous system does that is it's always learning new predictions about how the movement is gonna unfold. So to recap, the nervous system is constantly trying to predict um, how your movement is gonna unfold. And it does so partially because you can't rely on time delayed feedback. I told you earlier, feedback has already happened. So if you didn't have this, this um, muscle activity in, in anticipation, you'd knock yourself over. And this is what some of our patients do. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about them in, in a few minutes. Okay. So we study motor learning by exposing people to novel experiences that they've never encountered before. What do I mean by that? Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you a series of experiments on a, a special treadmill, a split belt treadmill, um, where we can control all kinds of things and try to understand how the nervous system is learning to predict this new environment and control movement. Now, my laboratory studies reaching movements, walking movements, balance, a variety of things, but I, I, I've limited the talk to walking because we've got some good examples of some interesting ways we can, we can dissect the learning and interesting ways that we can apply that. So, if we have somebody walk on our treadmill, usually we dress them up in spandex and um, we put markers all over them. Uh, we do do some um, machine learning visual tracking as well, but the gold standard is actually doing this marker system to, to track movement. So usually they don't look like they're wearing, you know, a sweater and pants. They're in like a nice running outfit. And we ask them to walk on this treadmill. And so people will walk on the treadmill and we will be measuring the joints of their body, um, their feet, their knees, hips, et cetera. And one of the things I'm gonna show you as we measure this movement is that I'm gonna care a lot about a step length. And I think that's quite intuitive. It's the distance between your two feet as you're stepping. And so we will look, be looking at consecutive steps and how you have to relearn how to step when you're encountering something that you didn't predict. And the thing you didn't predict is that my treadmill lets me make one leg walk at one speed and another leg walk at another speed. Yes, so much fun. <laughs> Further, and I'll tell you this later, my treadmill can make one leg walk forward and the other one walk backwards. <laughs> so, and you're gonna see that. Okay, so so this is the, this is the, um, the method that we're gonna use. It's just a cartoon. And now what I'm gonna show you, because um, I think it's more intuitive to actually see the movement, you're gonna see balloon guys. These balloon guys are actually animations that we've taken from, from people's data. So these are real, um, this is real data just being displayed in the form of a balloon guy. And this data is from motion tracking, 
uh, of people walking on the treadmill, and you'll be able to see features of movement that are important, uh, good markers, at least of this learning. So the basic task is that we're gonna have people walk on a normal treadmill, and then we're gonna split the treadmill belts so that one belt is two, three times faster, and then we're gonna go back to the normal treadmill. Now, the important thing that you're gonna see right now is that when you um, walk on a normal treadmill, you make nice even steps and you walk um, normally or at least semi-normally, it depends on you know if you're an inf a, a toddler or an adult, but when we split the treadmill belts, you can no longer use that motor pattern to produce symmetric even walking. And so you learn a new pattern. You start out limping and then you, you stop. And then when we go back to the normal treadmill after you've trained here, you don't just flip back to your old walking pattern. You have to actually unlearn the pattern that you just learned. So this is subconscious, subcortical, and it's robust. You can't outthink it. So let's look to see how this guy does. We're gonna start with the normal treadmill. And what you're gonna see is this guy walking along and I'm animating below. It's gonna show you how the, um, the leg swings forward, backward, forward, backward, forward, backward. You'll see a yellow trace for the yellow leg and a blue trace for the blue leg. Okay, here we go. So this is normal treadmill walking and I'm gonna stop it and show you step lengths. So those were even step lengths. And the other thing you see is they walk in nice antiphase. So when the yellow leg is in front, the blue leg is in back. So this is a very nice, simple, beautiful walking pattern. Now, what's gonna happen when I make one leg walk three times faster than the other? So one possibility is you take three steps per one, right? It's possible, it's not really what you do, but that's a possibility. But what happens is they the, the legs wanna stay in that nice, as close to antiphase as they can. And so you initially adopt a limp. So you're gonna see the same thing. I'm gonna pause for two consecutive steps so you can see the limp. And then I want you to watch the rest of the video. So there we go. Long step, short step. And so this, is a limping pattern that you can do immediately when one belt is walking, moving three times faster than the other. So anybody in here I put on this, you would be able to do this without, I have people watch TV while they do this. People can do this immediately, but you can imagine that that's not really an optimal walking pattern when you're walking like this. And we've shown in the past that it's energetically in, in, uh, uh, inefficient, it, um, it, it taxes your balance, and so you give people 10 minutes on this treadmill. This is the same person. And what you see is they learn to take pretty symmetric steps. And they also learn to have their legs moving in antiphase. That's even though one leg is going three times faster. So this is a learning process that happens over the time course of minutes and makes new predictions about how your movement's gonna unfold and happens pretty subconsciously. So it's pretty cool. Now, as I, as I alluded to, when we go back to the normal treadmill, what you're gonna see is that you don't do nice normal symmetric walking. You actually limp in the other direction and you have to walk it out. You have to unlearn it. So tiny step, big step, and so this is, you can't outthink this. Everybody comes to my lab thinks that, ah, uh, I know what you're doing and I'm not gonna have this, this after effect. But in fact, they do. And so this is the paradigm that I'm gonna be using to show you a few different things that I think are interesting. And I'm gonna illustrate it sometimes with these little balloon guys, uh, again, from real data. And then um, I'm gonna show you a few videos of people actually taking advantage of this. So the first thing I'm gonna show you we're gonna talk about what is learned. What, what are you learning on this treadmill? And by this, I mean, um, let's, let's characterize some of the basic features of this learning. Is it direction specific? What I mean by that is, if you learn a new motor pattern on the split belt treadmill in forward walking, does that transfer to backwards walking? 
is the, are, is the neural circuitry that's doing this job, does it generalize to different forms of walking? And so we've tested this, and this is the generalization. It does, does backwards transfer to forward? Does forward transfer to backwards? And it turns out they don't transfer, which means that it is direction specific. So what that tells you is if I put you on my treadmill, I can teach you one walking pattern going forward and you'll store it for, and I'll teach you another walking pattern going backwards. And they are separable, which suggests that the circuits that are controlling these two behaviors, um, even though it's walking, are, are separable. Now, you might think, well, why do I care about that? Um, and I'll, I'm gonna get to that. The other thing I'm gonna show you is, is it leg specific? In other words, are, is, is it the coupling between the legs that you're learning? How you gotta get this one back while this one's forward? Or is, is each leg capable of learning something on its own? And this is where we engage the dreaded hybrid walking. And so for this, we actually have a right leg going forward and a left leg going backwards. I call this hybrid walking. And what we're gonna ask is if I train you in this way, and I make you learn a new hybrid pattern, does it transfer to forward walking because you use this leg? And does it transfer to backwards walking because you use this leg? Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, so here's the experiment. Um, we're gonna have people walk on a normal treadmill, forward, backwards, and hybrid. And then we're gonna make them walk hybrid where one leg is moving twice as fast as the other. And so they're gonna learn a new pattern there. And then we're gonna see when you go back to the normal treadmill, do you see evidence of that learning in forward walking, backwards walking, or hybrid walking? So let's do it. We'll start with forward walking. So this is uh, somebody walking forward on the treadmill. The belts are the same speed, one to one. And now we're gonna have them walk backwards, same situation, but now we're gonna have them walk hybrid where one belt is going forward, the other backwards, but they're at the same speed. And that's what you do. And people do this pretty readily. It's shocking how actually straightforward this is for people. Now we're gonna make them do two to one backward forward walking. And so one leg, the back leg is on the faster belt, and they can actually learn a new pattern. Look at, they start doing this, this beautiful in-phase walking pattern. So the question is, does that learning transfer to forward walking? And it does, you get this big limp. And does it transfer to backwards walking? And that learning does, you get a limp. And then you eventually go to hybrid walking and you see a little bit of it left but it's always hard to know what to make of hybrid walking unless you've studied it a lot because it's kind of weird to begin with. So my point is, is that we, we know now that we can, we can teach people something about how they're moving one of their legs um, in a specific direction, which is kind of cool because it actually might be useful for people, for example, who've had a stroke and we need to train that leg to, to cooperate, to work with the other leg, but we wanna train something specific about that leg. And I'm gonna show you that in a minute. Okay. So the other thing I wanna tell you about this learning that I think it, it, it always blows me away is you're not just learning movement control. You're not learning just the prediction of movement, but you're also, your prediction affects your perception. And so what does that mean? That means that the way you feel like your leg is moving changes. So what we do, is I'm gonna show you an example of this. We can actually test your perception before, right after you've done your regular treadmill walking, and then we're gonna do it again here. Now, this is a, another strange walking guy, but this is again, a, a real person. And we're gonna do a perceptual test. So this test takes one leg and we set a speed for this leg. The blue leg, we're gonna make it go half a meter per second. That's the speed in meters per second. And we're gonna plot this, how this leg is changed to try to match this speed, okay? So this person is wearing 
earphones draped so they can't um, they can't hear the treadmill, they can't see their legs. And they're gonna use this little button box to change their leg speeds. Okay, so their job, their only job is, I'm gonna start the blue belt, make your red leg match it in speed. And you've gotta use that proprioception we talked about in order to do this, because we're not letting you look and we're not letting you hear the belts. Okay, here's what they do. We start the blue leg and now the, they're adjusting the red leg. And what you can see is that they already start to home in on an equal speed. Oh, they go up a little and then they change their mind. They're doing this over 30 seconds. And you can see that, yeah, they're pretty darn good at this. So a little noise here, but they're pretty good. So now we're gonna do the same thing, but it's after you've learned that walking pattern on the split belt treadmill, where one leg is fast and the other leg is slow. So in this case, the fast leg was the red leg. That's the one I trained fast. Same test, you're gonna see the speeds and here you're gonna see how even their steps are. So we start the treadmill with the blue leg. Their job is to make the red leg feel like it matches the blue. Yeah, so now that feels like they're moving at the same speed for them. The person feels like their red leg and their blue leg are going exactly the same speeds. And they also can take symmetric steps at this, at this speed. So they have stored not only a motor, um, a, a learned motor pattern, but that motor pattern um, is accessing their perception, or at least they're using the motor pattern to inform perception. And so when we have people who've had a stroke and we put them on this treadmill, often they comment that their leg feels lighter after they've been walking on it. And it's par partially because they're changing their perception of how hard it is to move their leg. Okay, so I've shown you that what's learned is um, leg specific, direction specific, and it changes your perception. So now we're gonna get to what, how do people with damage to different parts of the brain learn? And so this, is a structure called the cerebellum. I've also colored in the brainstem, but this guy right here is the cerebellum, the little brain. And this is the cerebrum. This is a lower center in the brain, at least uh, anatomically. Uh, I would argue it's a pretty smart center in the brain. Um, but the cerebellum is actually, we found, essential to that kind of sort of subconscious learning of new motor patterns. And so I'm gonna show you an example of patients who have cerebellar damage trying to learn this task. It's the same thing I've shown you before, but I'm gonna show you side by side. People with cerebellar damage um, uh, exhibit something called ataxia. And ataxia, it actually means disordered. It's disordered movement. They're not weak. They haven't lost their sensation of their, of their body, but their movements are clumsy, uncoordinated. People often describe them as having a drunk looking gait because they're not coordinating where one part of the body is relative to the other. People with cerebellar damage, when they do the test that I showed you earlier where you pick up your arms, they don't activate this muscle in anticipation and they fall or they have to catch themselves. So this is a part of the brain that seems to be helping you to make predictions about movement and, uh, and allow you then to create the right pattern of muscle activity to make that movement effective. So let's look at how cerebellar, a cerebellar patient looks on this. You'll notice I'm gonna have them walk slower because they refuse to walk faster for me um, because they feel unstable. And then you're gonna see the same kinds of traces that I've shown you before. So this is somebody with a cerebellar lesion walking cerebellar damage walking on the treadmill. And you could see that they were taking nice steps and they're in good antiphase here. And so now I'm gonna make them walk where one belt is twice as fast as the other. And so this is what that looks like. Looks like what we saw before, small step, big step, small step, big step, and the legs aren't in perfect antiphase. Now, I, uh, 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 somebody who does not have cerebellar damage, they would start limping, and then after 10 minutes, they wouldn't be limping anymore. 
But what we see is there's still some limping, a little bit less, but they actually really aren't learning much in this task. We've trained them up to 30 minutes. We've trained them on multiple days. And so they're not updating this prediction of their movement. And so what we find is that when we go back to the regular treadmill, they don't show much of an after effect. They don't show much of that learning that we were trying to get them to make. So if you're trying to rehabilitate somebody who can't do this kind of learning, who can't recalibrate their movement, it's very hard because this is a low level fundamental thing that we rely on all the time. You are always recalibrating your movement predictions. And, and this is an essential part of keeping you mobile. So now, what happens if you damage the cerebrum? So this is where you uh, typically, people most commonly have strokes. And this is, um, it, usually it's in the middle cerebral artery. So up here where you know the sensory and motor cortices are, what that means is where the cortex that's sensing and the cortex that is um, helping to generate voluntary movements. So I'm gonna show you the most extreme cerebral lesion that, we, that we've been able to study. And it's an unusual um, condition. It's, it's, uh, it's a surgical lesion. And so this, um, there we go. So this is a child um, who's had something called a hemispherectomy. And a hemispherectomy is when they remove an entire cerebral hemisphere. So this is a, this is a view through the brain like this. So, and what you can see here is the, is the space where the cerebrum on this side of the brain used to be. And so now they only have one hemisphere of the brain. They still have a cerebellum. So that's a cross section through that cerebellum, which we know you need to learn this kind of, kind of um, movement. So, um, this child gave us uh, permission to use her video. This is actually a child who had surgery within the last year. Um, and by the way, these surgeries are, are, are done for children who have a few different conditions that cause really medically intractable seizures that are so extreme um, that they end up, um, that through experience, they know that taking out just a part of the brain isn't gonna stop the seizures. So they take out a whole hemisphere. Okay, so let's look to see how she walks. So this is gonna be the normal treadmill. And what I want you to notice is that when she walks, she's gonna come up on one toe to try to get her bad leg, her affected leg to swing through. There's her affected leg. And she's gonna to try to use this leg to help it, but she's gonna have a limping pattern. So here she is on the normal treadmill. You see her go up on her toe, trying to get that leg to swing through. Okay, so, and that's me walking in front of the camera. Um, okay, so now what are we gonna do? We're gonna actually use the split belt treadmill not to correct the bad leg, not to use it to help it. We're gonna use it to try to make it harder for her. The reason is we want her to learn a new pattern, not just when she's walking on a split belt treadmill, but when she goes back to the regular treadmill. And so, you're gonna see, this is during split belt walking, you're gonna see that I'm gonna make this leg right here walk twice as fast as this leg. So it's the kind of thing I was doing before with the um, uh, cerebellar patients and the typically developing folks. So now it's really hard for her and you'll see she kind of stumbles. And so she's gotta recalibrate how she's gonna be making these movements um, on the treadmill. So we let her walk for 10 minutes and then the important thing is going back to this regular treadmill, normal treadmill, and comparing it to what she did here. And so I want you to look at this and I want you to notice that she is not gonna vault on her toe and she's gonna be able to take nice symmetric steps. So that's 10 minutes using this brain mechanism to change her locomotor pattern. Now, does 10 minutes of training mean that she's done? No, of course not. So this mechanism we think is constantly recalibrating your movement. But the important thing is that it allows us to um, show that she's capable 
of producing a motor pattern that's that's more um, uh, more optimal for her, but she can't get there voluntarily. I can't tell her to do that because it's very hard for her to use. She doesn't have a cerebrum and to use the other side of her brain to do that. And so we have used this, um, this learning mechanism to, um, to be able to put people in a state where they're actually performing walking the way that, that they want to and that we want them to. And so we actually, oh, I forgot. I wanna show you, we trained her. Um, look, people, full disclosure, yes, we trained her. A, a lot of these kids, some don't do as well, some do really well. Um, walking recovers much better than hand movements and you'll see her hand is still paretic. Um, but this is her walking as a 13 year old um, uh, wearing Crocs, which is not the best thing for walking. But um, but if you know, this is my crummy video, I was at a at a reunion. You can see you wouldn't really know until you you can see her hand, and that's because she can't activate hand muscles because there's nothing else to substitute for that when you take out that hemisphere. But with walking, you can use all this stuff down below. And we can actually use the, the, the subcortical structures below the cortex to help get her in the right, move her in the right direction. So what about cerebral stroke? I mentioned it earlier. Now you remember that um, I showed you that I can um, make, I could make any one of you limp on my treadmill if I made one of the belts go faster. And then you would learn to, you would learn to compensate then you would limp in the other direction. What if I can take my treadmill, just like I did with that little girl, and I can, I can take somebody with a cerebral stroke who limps, and I could train them so that they don't limp in the after effects. Well, this is, this is the kind of training that we think is at least useful to get people into the, the, the space we want them to be in for, for um, walking control. Now, I want you to watch this. This is just their baseline, but I want you to watch it. It looks very much like the limps we were we were seeing in our healthy participants, although you can see that the blue leg is stiff, but they have a, a short step and a long step, and they have trouble advancing that blue leg. So we've actually um, run one sort of open label um, uh, trial where we trained people for four weeks doing this. And what I'm showing you here, we trained 12 different patients. And this graph shows you whether their asymmetry in stepping, how uneven their steps were, got worse or improved. And improvement here is that we reduce the asymmetry. So it's, it's down here, the bars are pointing down. And so the point is, is that we have varying responses to this kind of training, um, but by and large, most of the people move in the right direction. And we, in this study, we didn't pay a lot of attention for how to make this stick, but um, in, in, a, in future work, we've already started doing that with a different kind of learning that we layer on top. So um, this can actually change the way that people um, move, it can change a long, you can give a long-term effect. And I think that it's just an example of how understanding learning and specific kinds of learning can be leveraged to help people who have different kinds of, of damage to the nervous system. So here are some things I want you to remember. You don't have to remember them all, but maybe a couple of them. First of all, you should, your brain is always, always, always learning to control movement. And you're never really thinking about a lot of these things. So you're not thinking, oh my God, I've got to turn my tibialis anterior muscle on more because I'm picking up a grocery bag. You don't do that. And so, so the brain is constantly recalibrating and learning. Um, that learning, the experience that your children have early is critical for laying down the foundations for that. And even in somebody who's had a hemispherectomy where the connections are different, can still take advantage of, of the kind of learning I've just shown you. Uh, the learning is leg and direction specific for this kind of walking learning, and it can change both how you move and how you perceive your moving. Um, 
we know this is uh, relies on the cerebellum and that it's making new predictions. And this cerebellum dependent learning is available for people with damage to other brain regions. So when we can take advantage of, of it, it's actually a useful tool. And so um, I think we're at 615. And I just want to tell you that a lot of people work on these projects. Um, they're non-trivial to get people in to do all the quantitative analysis that we do um, to characterize everything. Um, and so these are collaborators over many years and my PhD students and postdocs over, over many years and the people who have generously funded our work. Um, and so I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amy. We have time for questions or discussion. Carla, right away. So I'm very curious about the training part. So um, you say that you train the individual for four weeks. Mm -hmm. So in this short, short, uh, um, sorry. Um, I understand that you train the individual for four weeks. Is are this uh, small windows of training? Is this a continuous training? And and is there any correlation? I mean. I, I wonder how is that this person managed to remember the training for the That's, rest of their life? It's an excellent, so I don't know if they remembered it for the rest yeah, of their life, yeah, but they did for three it. months. Yeah. Um, we did test that. So here's here's what we did. This is an excellent, it's an important point. And I apologize for not going over it. What we did is we put them on the treadmill three times a week. We adapted them for only 10 or 15 minutes to try to get the symmetric pattern. Took them off the treadmill let them walk and we we just gave verbal reinforcement like oh you know how does it feel you, you're taking even steps and i think it's the combination of those two things i think we need to use reinforcement learning once we get them in the state that we want them in and so it's learning everybody is not one thing and luckily we can dissect out different learning mechanisms and try to put them together in different ways to take advantage of them so that's what we did yeah <clears throat> oh, okay. All okay. right. Uh, yeah, sorry. Go ahead, Jess. Does it matter how long the damage to Facebook will be for the training? Not in this case. We trained people. Well, oh, I can't say that. I think really acute damage, I don't know because we haven't done this on an inpatient floor. But anything subacute or chronic, we, we get really good learning in stroke. I will also tell you, though, there are some limits. So some people walk so slowly that they take a step, and they stop, they sort of re-equilibrate, then they take another step, they stop. It doesn't work well with them. And I think it's because that's less, it's not engaging the same walking circuits. It's standing and then stepping and then standing and then stepping. And that's not actually walking. And it engages different circuits in the nervous system. Yeah. So I'm gonna take in the next question if I can. Oh, sure. So, We've been talking a lot about things that happen suddenly, whether it's a surgical procedure, an injury, a stroke. Right. What about the kind of slow stuff that happens to our body over time? Yes, fans, gaining weight. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> you don't do that overnight. You might have a big meal, but nope. you, you gain weight. Your your morph your morphology changes. The it's, loads change. The loads change. And then I could almost imagine that the compensatory programming in the cerebellum could lead to some things that could then lead to downstream injury, like a back injury because you're leaning back, et cetera. Is that? So is I, that... I'm going to, I'm going to say I, it, it's definitely possible, but here's what I'm going to say. I'm going to say that one of the best ways to develop a bad habit, a bad movement habit, I think is probably done through reinforcement learning. And let me give you an example. If you've had a stroke, and you're in the hospital, and you don't even have, you're acute, you don't really have, you're going to, potentially regain strength in your leg and sensation. But the first thing you're desperate to do is to be able to walk to the bathroom, right? And so you get up and eventually you can walk to the bathroom by you know, doing this. And that works for you. And that's reinforcing. And that's a different, different system in the brain. So this is a reinforcement-based system. And so then you continue to do that. Now, if you have an, a, a therapist that says, no, you're not gonna do it that way. We're gonna do it this way. And you don't like them. 
but you, you try to do that. Um, but the point is, is that reinforcement is a good way of developing a habit. Um, adaptation, the beauty of it is that it's fluid. It's always adapting you. So you wouldn't, you would probably be slowly adapting to the load, wherever the load may be. <laughs> and, and, um, the nervous system hopefully is, is adapting you to a good pattern. I would think pregnancy would be a good model. Pregnancy is a good model. And I can, I fell down when I was pregnant. I, I, I mean, because I had not adapted pr appropriately on the surface that I was on. And yeah, it's horrifying. But um, <laughs> if I stick a heavy backpack on you, you might not adapt yeah. uh, as okay. well. Anthony, again. Um, so I'm going to back up. You know that the cerebellum is the one place in the brain where you just don't add connections, but you add cells. Yes. During the time when you're getting ready to make those 2,400 steps per yes. hour. Yes. So what is the distinction between trying to do this kind of training during that period where the system is actually not yeah. only adding and subtracting and, connections, and but cells? The cells are migrating. Right. Okay. So it's an excellent point. The cerebellum actually doesn't reach that peak volume. Remember I showed you that cere the cerebrum gets really dense connections and then it, it, it prunes them down. Cerebellum reaches peak volume between in humans between age seven to 15, depending on the, what you read. And so it's definitely, actually that toddler is a little cerebellar patient, but essentially because their cerebellum isn't there. So I think they're using reinforcement learning, uh, reward-based learning to train the system. And that's good for learning a given pattern, but to adjust that pattern for all different things, you need the cerebellum. So we've done studies across childhood starting at age three, and we show that really you're not a, using a cerebellum dependent mechanism, at least partially, until you're around eight. And you it's not adult-like till you're 12. So this really is It's not as available, it's partially available. And we've done a recent study over hundreds of kids using arm movements, we see the same pattern. And everybody's shocked because these kids, they can they look terrific, but they, they don't adapt at the same speed or to the same extent. Greg. I'm very interested in your observations, which I think are profound, about the interdependence between various strands of learning yes. and behavior that we sometimes treat almost as if they're independent. Right. And then I'm interested in the application of the technologies that you are mm -hmm. introducing us to, to better understand how different environmental affordances mm -hmm. encourage or discourage normal development yes. in biologically um, uh, intact, healthy, very young children, infants, and especially over this first two or three years of life, it seems to me that you are on to a way with just a little bit of additional technology that you could quantify what those affordances are and probably link together motor development, cognitive growth, social interchange. Yes into a much more coherent package than we currently have available to us. Is that something that interests you? Very much. Uh, and given your large cast of characters, yes. uh, it would probably require that kind yes. of a cast to pull it off. But I am very impressed at the implications, yes. not only for people who already have enormous challenges, but for us to better understand how to create the kinds of environments yes. that are experiences, not just environments, but the, right. the, the organism environment interface that will really allow a fuller development of people's potential. Yes, so that's a beautiful you're, you're, question. That's a beautiful your talk question. is just very provocative. Oh, thank you. Um, uh, so quickly, what I'll tell you is that um, we know well, first of all, I'll start from the 
end and work my way back to the beginning. We do, I have a group of faculty and um, students and postdocs that work with me. And we are now actually using machine learning to analyze videos of very young babies um, who are at risk for autism because they have a sibling with autism. And so we're looking at the motor markers um, of, of any kind of phenotype that would predict whether they're, they're gonna go on to have autism at very early ages, six months. So that's one application of what you're saying. Now, I think one of the profound things that you said is that, um, or you implied and you said, you know, motor cognitive development, emotional development or social development. You have, movement is, is essential to exploring your environment, which is essential to cognitive development. And movement is also, it's not totally essential, but it's pretty important for learning social dynamics. And so my, my feeling is that we have to be able to, tr to, to know. So I guess the short answer is I haven't done that yet, but the, the point is, is that we would like to understand what kinds of motor activities and, skill, and skills that we have people, uh, children develop are best at facilitating that. Do we need to have kids move in really unpredictable environments? Do we need to have kids do lots and lots and lots and lots of practice of a given movement? Do we need to have kids um, um, uh, creating a lot of variation and interaction? No, nobody knows this. Right. Yeah, and so I think that's really important. One thing that people do know is actually with Down syndrome, you can train somebody on a these kids on a treadmill very early on. And that actually greatly progresses when they'll, they're able to learn to walk. So you can, you can take advantage of that. Um, another example is, you know those little bikes that the kids push around with their feet, the, the little tiny ones, the balance bikes? That's exactly an example of an affordance that will allow that child to learn to ride a bike really fast as soon as they get the pedals. They got to get the balance down and it helps. So that's just all. <clears throat> Time for one last question. Go ahead. Push the button up. Thank you. That's going to be a tough act to follow there. But um, uh, so I was wondering, you showed the child and you also discussed um, stroke patients as well. I'm wondering if you've noticed any variation in the success of this treatment that you would be able to attribute to the age of the patient? So it's a good question. Um, we haven't seen any age-related phenomena in the adults, which is good news, right? <laughs> um, uh, these kids, I, I had been studying these kids rather than kids that had a perinatal stroke, a stroke very early in life. Um, you don't actually get a lot of these hemispherectomy kids in the lab. So I don't really have good data that I would feel confident in telling you that there's an age dependent effect. What we did do that with those kids though, is we imaged their brains and looked at the integrity of pathways. And we compared kids that had hemispherectomy like at six months old to those who had it. We had somebody who had it at age 13 and, so, and, and the ages in between. And you can see the integrity of certain pathways change the earlier you took out the hemisphere, the better they did. So um, it's a it's a fascinating uh, phenomenon, but unfortunately, I don't have enough data to answer your question. Please join me in thanking Dr. Bastian.